Good afternoon, folks, and welcome. Uh, thank you for having me today. As you can see here, I am with the Civil War Defenses of Washington. Now, folks may say, well, I've never seen that. I never heard about that. Uh, what is that? The Civil War, National, uh, Civil War Defenses of Washington is a program that coincide with the three major parks that we just talked about. Rock Creek Park, National Capital Park East, and the George Washington Memorial Parkway. Each of these parks has Civil War earthworks forts in them. So therefore, these forts was made out of earth um, at the time. Um, they did not have time to actually make these forts out of um, stone. After the war, some of these forts remain. Other land was actually given back to the people that they acquired the land from. And therefore, right now, uh, with the Civil War Defenses of Washington, there used to be roughly about 69 of these forts circling the capital of Washington, D.C. And the Park Service is now in company of a few of them. And others are on private land or actually with Fairfax County um, and also other areas like that. So today we are going to be talking about, in this program, is from slaves to enstatesmen. Um, that's the program we're gonna be talking about. And there you actually see the photos of the gentleman that we will be talking about today. From 1870 to 1901, 22 African Americans served in Congress. 13 of these men have been born enslaved mothers and all had some form of education and half had gone to college. What we have here is uh, Reeves is from Mississippi, uh, who is in 1870 became the first to the US Senate and was born by free parents from North Carolina. The other representative, Benjamin S. Turner of Alabama, Jefferson M. Long from Georgia, Robert C. D. Large of South Carolina, and Joseph H. Reney of South Carolina were all former enslaved people. So you have that there. Joshua T. Walls of Florida and Robert Brown Emmett was all born of free parents. So since 1870, the Senator Reeves of Mississippi and Reney of South Carolina had become the first African American to serve in Congress and then more than 162 African Americans have served in the US representative, delegates, and senators. So what we're gonna be doing is talking about these men, talking about how they came about of going into Congress and what actually happened to them afterwards. Is there any questions so far? We have a very small group here. No? Okay. There's one picture of them more, their dates. Okay, so the first gentleman we're gonna be talking about is Herman Reeves. As I said before, on June 20th, 1870, the Mississippi State Legislators appointed him to, at the seat of the U.S. Senate. And the reason why that had been remained empty since Mississippi seceded from the Union uh, nearly a decade earlier. So since they had dec uh, seceded from the Union, their seat was vacant and then he actually got elected to take it. Now, he came uh, from North Carolina, so he was not a native Mississippi. He uh, was a preacher uh, and served as the first American, African American to serve in Congress. And he promised on his ticket to help African American emancipation and enfranchisement. So he was going to help them move forward now that they're emancipated, that therefore it will help them be able to stand on their feet. Um, that was his ticket. Now, what actually happens when he actually toured um, in the United States, he was actually introduced as the 15th Amendment in flesh and blood. So that's actually how they were, were promoting him uh, when he was actually touring the United States. And what actually happened was uh, he was actually five weeks after uh, Reeves was appointed, uh, Mississippi, excuse me, Massachusetts escorted him, Senator Henry Wilson, to the front of the Senate chamber to take his oath on February 25th, 1870. The newspaper reported, a curious crowd, color and whites, rushed into the Senate chamber and glazed at the colored senator. Some of them congratulated him. 
a very respectable looking, well-dressed company of colored men and women then came up and took Reeves captive and bore him off to glee and triumph. So that's actually what happened when he went to go get his, um, to get on the Senate floor and be sworn in. Unfortunately, his personal triumph was short-lived. He was appointed expired the following year. Um, a leading white Republican former Confederate general, James Alcorn, um, actually took his seat and therefore was placed for a full six-year term um, of that area. So therefore, he actually lost his seat in one year. And the incumbent coming in, a white Republican, actually had it for six years. So a very short time that he had there. But with that, he actually still went into politics. So he still worked into politics as well, even though he was a very short-lived person um, with that. Here. Oh, I have the pointer there? Okay, sorry. So what you actually see here um, is a marker for him in North Carolina. And um, you can see that. I don't know if you see it well. But that's actually talking about because what he actually was, um, besides that, was a barber. And they're actually talking about of his shop actually being there. And what I was talking about with that uh, is how he actually um, laid the brace. I don't think I have. Let's see on there. Let's see how it works. Okay, yeah, it does have his. And this is actually where he's laid to rest. As you can see there, his burial in Hillcrest Cemetery um, in Mississippi there. Now, what actually happened to him afterwards is that he did still settle. He was a preacher, so he had a congregation. He also was a barber, so he had a shop. And therefore, that is what he worked with. Now, he did try to advocate desegregation in schools and on the railroads. And also he worked with to reward by the Democratic um, excuse me, administration of following different things going on in the city that he was in. So he still was doing local politics, no more of the federal stuff as that. Now, unfortunately, what happened to him, um, he died of a stroke. Um, on January 16, 1901, while actually attending a religious conference. Uh, so that's actually what happened to him, and that's what you have there. The je next gentleman we have is Joseph, Joseph Henry Reney, June 21st, 1832 to August the 2nd, 1887. He was from Georgetown, South Carolina, and a former enslaved. He was first to serve in the United States House of Representatives, second to serve in the United States Congress, and the first presiding officer of the House of Representatives. Other than elected earlier for other things, but were not seated for the House of Representatives. His parents had been former enslaved, and his father actually brought the family freedom and then was trained as a barber. They moved to Charleston in 1846, and therefore Reney traveled outside of the South, back to the North, where he actually met his wife in Pennsylvania. Now, before he actually got his freedom, in 1861, he was forced during the war, was forced to work um, in a Confederate blockade runner um, during the Civil War. And with that, he escaped, and actually him and his wife actually escaped to Bermuda. Um, there, after the war, they came back uh, to the United States, where he actually set up a shop um, here in um, South Carolina. Now, what actually happened with him, he served in the 41st Congressional and was appointed to the Committee of Freeman Affairs and the Committee of Indian Affairs. So that was the committees that he was actually put in charge of. He did run for re-election in 1872 without any opposition. And in May of 1874, he became the first African-American representative to preside over the House session. 
Now, in 1876, however, uh, the Democrats was reemerging uh, as a dominant force in the South Carolina area at the end of the Reconstruction period. And Reney had a brief defeat, defeated, uh, briefly defeated a Democrat named John S. Richardson uh, for Congress. Now, because he did defeat him, Richardson conceded this vote for nearly two years, saying that it was uh, rigged. Um, uh, so that's what actually happened with him. And in 1878, Richard did eventually win the seat, and that ended Rainey's career uh, with that. He did return to South Carolina. In 1879, he was appointed as internal revenue agent uh, in the state by President Ralford A. Hayes. So he actually got an appointment um, after serving um, in Congress. He had the post until 1881. When he returned to Washington, D.C., he was hoping to serve as a clerk in the House of Representatives. Um, but unfortunately, he was unable to get that appointment. Um, and therefore, he started a business as a brokerage firm um, and banking firm as well. Now, after that, uh, he returned to South Carolina. And unfortunately, he died um, on, in Georgetown on August the 2nd, 1887, surviving by his widow and five children. So that's actually the house that he had in Georgetown, South Carolina. Um, so it is a museum, and that's also a marker um, up there as well. Are there any questions so far? Okay. Okay, the next gentleman is Jefferson Franklin Long, March the 3rd, 1836 to February the 4th, 1901. Now, Mr. Long was a politician from Georgia. He was the second to be sworn in the U.S. House of Representatives, and he was the only African American to represent Georgia until Andrew Young in the election of 1972. So that's a long stretch. Um, he was born and enslaved. In March 3rd, 1836, in Knoxville, uh, Knoxville, Georgia, a small town west central in, in Georgia. He was trained as a tailor, so that was his occupation. He opened a successful business in Maycomb, Georgia, uh, after he was emancipated after the Civil War. Now, what I always like to tell folks in these things is you see that even though these people were enslaved, they did have some kind of form of education to actually start a business and so forth. So even though that you had laws at the time, uh, even before the Civil War, of educating um, enslaved people, they did have that because if they were actually going to be, if that was their skill um, when they were enslaved, they were still going to use that skill uh, when they actually became emancipated. So um, like I said, he was trained as a tailor. He opened up a successful business. Uh, he did get married and raised seven children. And unlike the others, uh, the neighborhood and the area where he was at uh, did not have a majority black population, say for instance, like in South Carolina. So as a result, he was actually being backed by white politicians and leaders um, after the war. So that's who was actually backing him. Um, in 1869, he served on the Republican State Commission and was the leader of the Georgia Labor Convention, which organized black agriculture workers to demand increasing wages and better jobs and better working conditions. I tell folks, it's always sound familiar, right? Uh, what people are asking for. Um, now, the reason why he didn't actually get right into his appointment, because Congress delayed Georgia in re-minting into the Union uh, because the state refused the 14th Amendment. So they were actually expelled 29, legal, uh, 29 legally elected black members of the Georgia legislation was actually um, never set in, even though they did win, win the votes and so forth. Now, Condition to re-admit included reseating those men, members, and rectifying the 15th Amendment. So in July 1870, these terms were agreed on, and Georgia delegates were permitted to return to Congress. 
and then a special election to fill the delegation seat for the remaining of the 41st con Congress, which was 1869 to 1871, was seated for the sem same day, and that is actually how he, Long, actually got into that Congress. Now, during that Congress, he uh, was elected, and he was sworn in on June, excuse me, January 16, 1871. He took his seat one month after Representative Rainey of South Carolina was seated in the House. Long's term was so short that he actually never got to any committees at all because it took that long to get him in there. Um, but yet, he was determined to fight for the civil rights of the freed enslaved people that he was working with. So, even though his term was short, on February the 1st, 1871, he became the first African-American representative to speak before the House when he disagreed with a bill that exempt former Confederate politicians from swearing allegiance to the Constitution. Now, long argue against this, up there saying uh, that unprep represent, con um, excuse me, Confederates to return to Congress noting that many belong to the secret society like the Ku Klux Klan, which intimidate black citizens and have their, lead lo excuse me, their loyalty to the, a foreign government to rebuild political strength was a warning to him. And this is actually what he said. If this house removes the, the disabilities of disloyal men, I venture to prophesize you will again have trouble from the very same men who gave you trouble before. Now, unfortunately, his efforts was fruitless. The House voted 118 to 90 to grant amnesty. Uh, but he did try with that. Now, Long was the last black representative elected, as I stated before, to Georgia until Young in 1972. And after leaving Congress on March 3rd, 1871, he returned to his tailor business in Macomb, Georgia. And what actually happened is that the newspaper actually slandered him. They made him out to be uh, a radical, per se. And that actually damaged his business um, because of that. And a lot of his high intel clients who were actually uh, white citizens um, stopped coming to him with that. And that actually frustrated him uh, because of the of upheavals that was coming upon him and what the media had said about him, the newspaper at that time was saying things about him with that. But with that, I would say that he did preside, he did work on, and um, with that, he did talk about these things that was coming about. And what I wanted to show you, let's see here. Okay, so that's actually his grave in stone. So like I said, he did, he did stay in business and he still worked on uh, his own business um, all the way up to his death. But that's what you have with that. Is there any questions so far? Okay. The next gentleman we have is Robert C. D. Large. <clears throat> now, Robert D. C. Large uh, was born in Alcombe, South Carolina on March 15, 1842. It is indicated that he did, was born um, enslaved, but likely an offspring of free mulatto parents, um, is what they were saying with his records. He serves as the agent of the Freeman Bureau and helped organize the Republican Party in South Carolina. Uh, he was a politician and he was part of the Republican member of the United States House of Representatives for South Carolina, serving in 1871 to 1873. Now, a usual story about him was that his family um, did own enslaved people and was a member of the free mulatto elite and that was afforded uh, opportunities denied to darker skinned folks uh, in their area. With that, 
Uh, his family did. He was a former tailor. Uh, that was his occupation. And during the Civil War, uh, became a lucrative um, employment for the Confederate Navy uh, with his tailor business. And because of that, they believe that that's why they, his family um, did large donations uh, after the war uh, to the Republican Party and uh, for the African Americans that were running um, on that ticket uh, because of what they was making during the Civil War of uh, being a tailor business uh, for the Confederate Navy. With that, nevertheless, in 1870, um, the fortune that that family was up to $6,500. So back then in 1870, that was a large vast of money. Uh, so definitely they were making a lucrative business of during the Civil War. Um, and that's why they were actually um, <clears throat> giving it out and joining uh, Brown Fellowship Society uh, for organizing the Maletos um, in that area. So after the Civil War, um, he worked in the Republican state government, an agent for the Freeman's Borough. He organized the South Carolina Republican Party, serving on several, um, several committees on that. <clears throat> in 1868, uh, he was a member of the South Carolina Constitutional Congress Convention, which revised the state um, existing constitution. Um, at this convention, he was lobbied for the petition which would ask the U.S. Congress for more than $1 million grant to purchase land to be sold to the state land hungry poor. <clears throat> so this is actually what they were trying to do. Um, after the convention, he moved quickly from one important position to another. So as you can see, this gentleman was a go-getter and he was moving up the ranks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in 1871, he was chosen to the state legislature, <coughs> excuse me, as a land commissioner for the state. And then he began his turn as U.S. congressman on March 4th, 1971. <coughs> Which, however, once again, he was not allowed to serve his whole term. <coughs> excuse me. Now, what actually happened with Mr. Delard is that someone came up with charges of fraud. <clears throat> and he was uh, charged Levy by the Democrat opponent, Christopher C. Brown. Now what actually happened was the South Carolina representative, Joseph Rini, pleaded on the House floor to delay the case, um, but the committee reported uh, that the many abuse and irregularities during the election may determine the victor impossible. So they said it was flawed, fraud in the election. Rini, another gentleman uh, that we just talked about, pleaded to say, let's, let's wait about this. Let's see what's going on. It was not done. So on January 24th, 1873, they declared the seat vacant for the rest of the 42nd co Congress and set adjourned in March. The full house agreed with the committee findings and what they actually did was they defined, uh, excuse me, they found out uh, that there was no, f no fraud whatsoever, but the toll that it took on DeLong health uh, actually led him to retire. So he just retired from, the, from this. And a, another politician, Alonzo Rees, actually won his seat, which was another African-American. Now, when he left Washington, D.C., he returned to South Carolina and lived briefly in the capital of Columbia until he was appointed as magistrate. And there he served the people of Charleston until his death at the age of 31 on February 14th, 1874. And when he did pass away, uh, the city and statewide actually closed for the day um, because of his untiming passing. <clears throat> so that's actually where he's buried um, at this cemetery here in Charleston, South Carolina. <clears throat> so now we have Robert Brown Elliott. He uh, was born on August 11th, 1842. Uh, he was actually um, from Liverpool, England. Uh, his family was West Indies. Uh, he's received his public education, of course, in England. He was actually a typesetter by trade. 
Uh, he served in the British Navy and arrived in Boston on a warship in 1867. Now, what actually happened with him? Uh, he was associate editor of the South Carolina, a free newspaper owned by future representative Richard H. Kane. Uh, he did get married, and what actually happened was that they settled down, and he quickly drove into the Reconstruction period in politics in South Carolina. And he was the immediate emerging leader um, in 1868 for the state constitutional convention. One of 78 delegates um, at the convention, he advocated for public education. Um, but the interesting thing was he was not, he was opposed to school um, integration. So he was part of let's just be separate, get ourselves together first before we actually go into um, joining with others. Uh, he helped defeat the poll tax and also the literacy tests uh, for voters. So as you can see, even right there, they're actually trying to put that in, into play about the poll tax and the literacy test. And he helped defeat that um, when he actually got in. And later in 1868, while serving as the only black member of the Barnwell County Board of Commissioners, he was elected to the State House Representative where he remained until 1870. He almost was elected speaker, placing second on the ballot, and he went on to receive influential assignments as chairman of the Committee on Railroads and chairman of the Committee of Privileges and Elections. <clears throat> um, in 1869, the party became of his military background, and therefore they appointed him as assistant adjunct general for South Carolina. And one report has said in this, he became the first African-American commanding general of South Carolina National Guards, which as the state militia was charged with fighting the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, so that was one of his appointment because they knew about his military record. Uh, in October of 1870, Republicans in the West Central South Carolina Congressional District nominated him uh, over the incumbent Solomon L. Ho to run for the seat of the U.S. House of Representatives. The district included the capital, Columbia, and had only a slight black majority. The district included the capital, and notorious, the person he was taking the seat from or was going, the seat was held, once held by a representative, Ponston Brooks, notorious for his caning assault of Senator Charles Summers in 1856. So if any of you guys are not aware about that, um, this gentleman caned another representative um, because he was talking about um, anti-slavery movement and uh, caned him, beat him up pretty seriously on that. Um, no charges was actually put on with that, but uh, he, he uh, he would became, actually unfortunately, he became a hero for those for slavery and Actually, uh, Summers became a hero for anti-slavery for getting that um, assault on, actually, I would say, with that. Um, Elliott faced union reform um, party candidates, and he actually was uh, from John E. Bacon, the son of a prominent aristocrat country family. Elliott defeated both of them uh, with 60% of the votes. He was sworn in on the 42nd Congressional 1871 to 1873 on March 4th, 1871. Now, the thing that came about with this, and I thought it was kind of ironic, was that when he actually came to Washington, D.C., they actually said that he was a genuine African uh, because of his skin color. So technically, this is uh, actually what they said. Described as a first genuine African in Congress, Eliot seemed to embody the new political opportunities and Southern white apprehensions ushered by the emancipation. And this is actually what he later recalled. I should not forget my first day in Congress. I found myself the center of attraction. Everything was still. So that's actually what came about with him. While others have said his dark skin came to a shock as the two other African-Americans on the floor, 
Joseph Rainey and Jennifer, uh, Jefferson Long were light-skinned mulattoes. So they're even giving comparison of their skin color uh, of this. Furthermore, his politics were more radical than his African-American colleagues, and he unwavered stands for black civil rights made, made many representatives of both sides wary of his intentions. Elliott was given positions on the Committee on Education and Labor, where he served during both of his terms. Now, I would say that maybe the reason why he was more intense than the other two was that he was from England. You know, so he had a different aspect of, of the situation than the other two who were actually here uh, and was from the United States. <clears throat> Just 10 days after he was sweared in, uh, challenging the amnesty bill, which reestablished the political rights of nearly all former Confederates and quickly followed the speech with another support of supporting the Ku Klux Klan bill aimed at curbing the terrorist Eight, uh, activities of this clandestine organization. Elliott's argument against the amnesty bill and ultimate failed, but he did press on the following year. Um, in April of 1st, his speech, he read a letter post by the Klan at the Union Courthouse Jail. So what actually happened when they're talking about this one was that a gentleman uh, was supposedly killed by some African-Americans, about four of them, I believe. And they were housed in the jail. The Ku Klux Klan came in and lynched them. Um, pretty much that's what happened with that. And with this bill that Emmett was trying to put in was to say that we could actually go out and get them. You know, we know who they are. We could find out who, we are, who they are and actually charge them of this, of this crime that they did. Um, it is custom, sir, of the Democrat newspaper to stigmatize the Negro of the South as being semi-barbarians conditions. But pray tell, who is the barbarian here? The murderer or the victim? I file back the teeth of those who make it most false and foul apprehensions upon the Negro of the South Southern states. So that was actually him talking about the Ku Klux Klan and also about this bill. Now, of course, like I said, the bill, um, his bill didn't go through, but this is what he was saying on the floor. Now, they did a third Ku Klux Klan bill, which reinforced freedmen voting rights and passed and was signed into law three weeks later. So you have that one actually get into law. The following October, President Ulysses S. Grant used the power granted by the bill to suspend hereby corpus in nine southern states facilitating the prosecution of the Klansmen. So they're actually coming for them. Because of his action, Emmett felt his life was in danger. Therefore, before leaving Columbia for the following day, he wrote to his wife with instruction just in case of his death. Um, because they know who actually tried to put this bill out, which the bill did get passed, and of course, he has every right to feel that his life is in danger. During his second term, Emmett worked to help pass Massachusetts Senator Charles Sommer civil rights bill to eliminate discrimination from public transportation, public accommodations, and schools. Emmett gained national attention for his speech rebuffing opponents of the bill who argued that the federal enforcement of civil rights was unconstitutional. Before a packed house, Emmett stated the universal support for the civil rights. I regret, sir, that the dark hue of my skin may lead a color to the imputation that I am controlling my motive personally to myself and my advocacy of that great measure of national justice. The motive that impels me is restricted to no such boundaries, but it is a board as your constitution. I advocate it because it is a right. So that is actually what he put up there. So just to answer your question when you were talking about is that you see they did have these laws in place. They were putting them in place for uh, these matters of civil rights. Now, in 1876, Elliott was elected South Carolina Attorney General. This would be his last public office. Democrats returned into power in 1876, ending the state rec uh, reconstruction period. He continued to practice law 
until 1879, where he was accepted an appointment as a special custom inspector for the Treasury Department. One year later, he worked for the Secretary of Treasury, John Sherman, presidency campaign as to manage for the Sherman Black delegates. In 1881, and it moved to North, uh, excuse me, New Orleans, where he established another law practice, and he stayed there until his death of malaria um, in August 9, 1884, in New Orleans, Louisiana, just two days shy before his 42nd birthday. So that's actually where he's buried in New Orleans, um, at the St. Louis Cemetery. Actually, it's called St. Louis Cemetery Number Two. Uh, so that's actually where he's buried uh, in New Orleans. And one thing I will like to say that I don't uh, know if folks realize that what actually happened was a lot of politicians, um, as you see here, and you may go on as you do your research, a lot of them went into the federal uh, practice. They also became federal employees. That was one way where the segregation and the discrimination was, I would say, less and therefore you could rise up uh, if you had the talent and education to do so. So you'll see that a lot of them actually got into the federal um, employment. Is there any questions so far? Okay. The next gentleman we have is Benjamin Sterling Turner. Um, he was an American businessman and politician, served in the U.S. House of Representatives, representing Alabama. Uh, first Congressional District in the 42nd United States Congress. He was a former enslaved person. Uh, he's a self-made man. Uh, he focused on restoring peace and repairing economic damage um, in the more ravaged South. Um, he was pretty noted, uh, actually, as the 1870s U.S. Uh, census. Uh, he was actually deemed to have uh, a personal property wealth of $10,000 and real estate of $2,500. So in 1870, that was pretty good money um, that this gentleman was having in his coffer. Two years later, he became involved in politics and with that participated in the Republican State Convention in 1867, uh, where Turner was named, to, named tax collector of Dallas County. That's actually where he was coming from. In 1870, he was elected to the United States Congress to represent Alabama, and what he said on the floor was this. These people have struggled long, longer and labored harder and have made more of the raw materials than any people in the world. Since they have been free, they have not slacked in their industry, but materialized and improved their economic, excuse me, ec equity, excuse me. So that was actually what he was there to do, was to help and maintain and bring forth better wealth uh, to the African American in his district. While in office, Turner proposed bills that contributed funding to the Civil War, relating to damage of several federal buildings in central Alabama and St. Paul's Episcopal Church. He was also appointed into the House Committee on involved pensions and was responsible for um, issuing pensions for Union War veterans. With that, he also worked with African American veterans so that they could receive their pensions as well. Now, he did fight for impoverished black farmers, and in uh, 1872, he did come to call the elimination of taxes on cotton uh, because he felt it was harming his constituents. With that, he also singled out this single crash cash crop um, that was coming out, arguing that the tax was unconstitutional to them. In May in 1872, he demanded that tax be refund for the years of 1866 to 1868 um, for the reason that that was, should be a uh, repetition for the ex-enslaved people, so that they should actually get money for being um, enslaved at that time period, or actually after, excuse me. All of his proposals was ignored. They were all shot down. Uh, Turner ran for a second term in 1872, but was challenged uh, by another Republican, another African-American named Philip Joseph. Uh, 
a free man before the Civil War and was a local newspaper. And because the black vote was divided between him and the other gentleman, uh, someone else actually won a white Republican, won the primary, and therefore got the congressional seat. So you have it there. Now, after his, uh, his politi politics was over, uh, Turner continued to be a political activist. He was uh, emerged in the 1880. He attended the Alabama Labor Union Convention and to serve as a delegate for the Republican National Convention in Chicago. So as you can see, he still was working even though he lost his seat and um, became a, a political powerhouse with that. Oh, he was a businessman. He was actually a businessman, and he earned, um, and he actually had land. Uh, so he actually had, um, he had 2,500 in real estate, and then he had $10,000 in personal property. So he was one of the wealthiest freemen in Alabama. <clears throat> and then what you have actually here is a marker um, for him there. And I think we might have... Nope, sorry. And that's actually where he is actually buried in Live Oak Cemetery. <clears throat> so you can see that they actually have a pretty big, um, they have a marker there, and they also have his gravestone there as well. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Walls. So Joshua Thomas Walls. December 30th, 1842, May 15th, 1905. He was actually served um, his term in Congress between 1871 and 1876. He was actually representing Florida, uh, elected during the Reconstruction area and was the first to be elected um, representing Florida. Now he, representing Florida, is the only black representative of Florida until the early 1990s. Um, is actually when that came about. He was unseated twice on the recommendation of the House Committee on Elections, but he still got his seat. He was born actually in this area, Winchester, Virginia, um, as an enslaved person. And during that time, he did um, work. Actually, he was forced to work for the Confederate Army until he was captured in May of 1862. That's how he got his emancipation. And with that, he became, uh, worked with the union, and then he went to school um, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to get his education. In 1863, he then served in the U.S. Army, um, in the U.S. Color Troop of the 3rd Infantry Regiment based out of uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He rose to the rank of first sergeant and prior to his discharge in 1865. After leaving the army, he actually settled in Florida, and that's where he started his political local career. Now, after passage of the United States Military Re uh, Reconstruction Act of 1867, that's when Walls joined the newly formed Republican Party in Florida. And that's actually how he got into that. He was elected delegate in 1868 with the state constitutional convention and shortly afterward was elected to the lower house of the Senate Legister in 1868. He advocated for a state Senate representing the 13th district uh, of his county in 1869. And he actually had a six year tenure at the US Congressional while filing with controversy. He was the only black representative unseated three times by opponents challenging his election in 1870, 1872, and 1874, including J.J. Finley, a former Confederate uh, general. So you can see he got, they kept contesting him, but he still came through uh, with those contests. Now, with that, he introduced, he introduced several bills uh, favoring land grants to the railroads a securing connection port of serving of Cuba and the West Indies. Walls also submitted measures to reinforce the Civil Rights Act of 1866. After serving in Congress, he returned to Florida State Legisters and resumed farming of his 175 acre farm in Gainesville, Florida that he acquired in 1873. 
He also purchased a, new a newspaper called The New Era. He remained active in political service. He served as the mayor of Gainesville and a member of the County Board of Public Instruction and County Commission. In 1896, he moved to Tallahassee and became a farm director to what is now Florida AMU University. Uh, he worked at AMU University until his death on May 15, 1905. But the, uh, the most shocking thing is that when he actually passed away, there was nothing in the paper about him when he passed away. So all his accomplishments was actually unknown until you know, recently now, but um, not at the time of his death um, in his obituary. So that's actually a, a marker uh, of his down in Gainesville, Florida, that was actually put up. And what I want to say, because he is actually our last, our last gentleman here, um, just like you had asked, um, what happened? What happened to all these men? You know, we, we are now hearing about them, but at the time, you know, what actually happened to them? Why haven't anyone ever heard of these folks? And the reason of is because of how they were deemed uh, with media at the time, which of course was newspapers, and how the scaling back of these civil rights acts that they put in, uh, especially in 1866 um, and of 1875, that all their accomplishment that they were working on was completely almost just wiped out until now, until now that we are reading about them, we're hearing about them. And um, this is just, you know, what I like to tell my folks when I do these programs is that if you're not careful, it can always happen again of these effects of these folks doing. I mean, they were, I would say they were astonishing men. Um, and now you have men and women uh, because, um, it wasn't easy for them. We know it wasn't. Um, being the first of anything, being that they were, I mean, we, we, I recited about how they talk about their skin color. Not that, oh wow, these gentlemen you know, picked themselves up from their bootstraps and went to get educated and now look at them here, but they weren't thinking of that. Um, so that is actually uh, what I always like to tell folks to uh, take away from these programs is that if they did it then, they can always do it now and it should be something we worry about. But once again, I'd like to say this is actually where he is actually buried, um, Greenwood Cemetery in Tallahassee. And I'd like to say that is the end of my program. If you have any comments or concerns or questions, please feel free to ask. If you want more information about the Civil War Defenses of Washington, that is our Facebook page, facebook.com uh, backslash CWDWMPS. Or you can have my information there, Ranger Finley Jean. My number is 202-603-1004. And my email is Kenya underscore Finley at nps.gov. So once again, folks, I say thank you for having me.